I'll unmute myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Ian Borden. I'm a, a professor of architectural history in the Bartlett School of Architecture. I'm the vice dean education for the faculty, and I'm one of the Bartlett Promise um, admin team. Uh, welcome to UCL. Um, hi, Peter McLennan here. Uh, I'm in the School of Planning, a uh, lecturer there, and uh, I'm the faculty graduate tutor taught, and basically that entails me having pastoral quality management and quality assurance oversight of all of our 54 odd programs and 2,500 postgraduate students. Hello, uh, my name is Zane Starr. I am a program manager at the Aziz Foundation. I manage our preferred partnership scheme and I lead on engagement with university stakeholders and our university partners. So, if you want to introduce yourself, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Here we go. My name is Saif Osmani. I'm a recipient of, um, of the Aziz Foundation Master's Scholarship of 2019-20. Um, I did a Master's in Architecture and Historic Urban Environments at the Bartlett. Um, in my own time, I'm a visual artist and a spatial designer. I've worked for developers to architectural firms, and I can answer any questions that you have on your student experience. Thank you all very much. Um, I will now pass on over to Umar for the presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, so what is um, the Bartlett promise? Well, it comes as a recognition from the Bartlett that the academic uh, um, environment and the industry, the built environment industry is not diverse enough. So this comes as a promise to do better and um, encourage students from various underrepresented backgrounds uh, from the Bartlett to pursue a master's here. Um, and the main goal is to provide the opportunity of a quality education for everyone, uh, regardless their background, um, economic means, and to also diversify the student body uh, in the Bartlett and also the built environment profession. So the scholarship covers the tuition, which will be funded for the whole duration of the program. But you'll also receive an annual allowance to cover living and studying expensive. Um, and this will be paid in three equal term installments, um, just like the, the student loan for, from the government. So similar to that. Um, in addition to the support that comes from the Bartlett, all the primary scholarships will receive ongoing academic support and career support during their studies. In order to be eligible for the um, scholarship, you have to meet all of these three conditions. So you have to be a UK domicile with a home and fee uh, status or be a forced migrant. And for that, you can check UCL's website to find more information. Um, you also need to have an offer to study at a master's program in the Bartlett for next year. Um, and also to, have completed a to not have completed a master's at UCL or anywhere else. So in addition to um, those three mandatory requirements, you also need to meet uh, one, at least one of these additional criteria to be in a financial need as assessed by UCL, uh, be from a back Asian and minority ethnic background uh, or for a gypsy Roma and traveler community, have a disability, be a care lever, have care responsibilities, uh, be first generation in family to attend university at undergraduate or postgraduate level. So in addition to what the Bartlett uh, provides through the, uh, through the Promise Scholarship, um, it, ha it has also partnered with Aziz Foundation, who also sh uh, shares the same um, visions like the Bartlett. So the I Aziz Foundation has um, agreed to fund um, three scholarships for applicants who meet one of one or both of these criteria to identify as a British Muslim or to work to support British, British Muslim communities. And uh, these award has the same values and conditions as the Bartlett, so uh, you can be considered for both as well. So when you apply, um, 
you can answer um, the uh, two additional questions to be considered for the ASIS Foundation Scholarship. Um, but this also has some program restrictions, which you can view on our website. Um, you will also join a community of ASIS Foundation Scholars, uh, in addition to the Bartlett Promise Committee. And you will also uh, gain additional support from um, the ASIS Foundation to build your leadership skills and to provide you with seminars, workshops, and opportunities to build your network. The application process for this year's Bartlett Promise um, will, um, will be based after you um, receive a, an offer to study at the Bartlett. So you don't need uh, any additional academic, uh, and you don't need to provide any additional academic uh, uh, details. Just read the facts on our website and complete the application form. When the applications will be assessed against the eligibility criteria mentioned before. And shortlisted candidates will be asked to engage in a one to one dialogue to discuss anything which you feel might support your application. And feel free to ask more questions about this in the Q&A. The dialogues will be conducted by the Windsor Fellowship and will take place by phone or Zoom. And the final decision will uh, be notified by 31st August 2021. Uh, the deadline is uh, Monday, 31st May, and the dialogues with the Windsor Fellowship will take place from uh, 21st June August onwards. Successful applicants will be notified by Tuesday, 31st of August. This is now the time to ask questions, uh, so please feel free to do so. If you feel that something has not been clearly explained by presentation, um, you can also ask questions about those. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Uma. That was great. Um, so like Uma said, you can um, start asking your questions. Uh, we've um, had some come in, so I will look at some of those now and pass that on to our panel. Um, so um, if I can ask you this one, um, Ian, what sorts of academic and career support is offered alongside the funds? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question, because we're, we're very aware that um, it's not just about giving someone money and financial support. Obviously, that's a huge part of it. It's a very generous scheme. We, we cover people's not only their fees, but also their living expenses and, their, and their, um, some of their uh, study costs. But we're very aware that when you come to your university, that, um, uh, that, that sometimes they can be quite daunting places. And I know these are for PGT awards, so people have already done an undergraduate degree. But nonetheless, this is a different level, a different intensity of study. And we're also very aware that some of the applicants and the people who received the Bartlett Promise um, Award do not necessarily have other family members or uh, a wider friendship group who are also in the same position. We're also very aware that um, people may not have the same um, uh, or depth of professional connections and career networks to build on. So we, it's probably worth saying that we, we've already run this scheme for, we're now in the second year of the scheme and we've done it already for one year just for undergraduate students. So we're now extending it to PGT postgraduate master's students and indeed to PhD students as well. So we're putting more uh, support into it. And we're delighted to be able to welcome partners like the, the Aziz um, Foundation as well to, to work with us and partner with us on this. So um, I suppose what I'm getting around to saying is that, that what we've, worked, we've realized and we've piloted with the undergraduate scheme is that we also know that it's not just about money and that we do want to give additional support. And we do that in a number of ways. So the most obvious one is that there's the community of scholars themselves. There are going to be probably 13 of these awards, including the uh, Aziz uh, Awards this year, just in the masters. So there's a community of those scholars and we want them to talk to each other and, um, uh, and support each other. We will also work, there's a group in UCL um, uh, for uh, the Centre for Learning, um, and they will also provide some support on mentoring and careers advice and that kind of thing. 
But we're also aware that as the scheme develops and goes on, that we're, we want to build up a community of scholars that stretches across years and includes people who've graduated. Um, and we're very much hoping that, that in future years, the people that are, have been our scholars will keep in touch, will be part of the scheme. Maybe they'll help to mentor uh, um, younger and newer uh, recipients of the awards as well. So it's, it's a package um, and it, it's not just money. Thank you, Ian. Uh, the next question, if uh, shortlisted, what kinds of questions or topic will be discussed uh, during the dialogue? Um, shall I say something about that as well? The first thing that I would say is what you will not be asked in the dialogue is the most important thing, is you won't be asked about your, your um, academic experience. These are not awards which are based on trying to identify you know, the very, 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 very most skillful academic or, um, candidates of all. We take the view that anybody who has been offered a place on a Bartlett master's course is um, a, a, an exceptional and very good academic ability and scholar. So these awards are not based on academic ability. We push that to one side. We, you will see when you, if and when you do the application that we ask for a number of information about your, about your background, your profile, um, your ethnicity, what your, a little bit of um, about whether your family have been to university or done master's degree before. There are some things about whether you have a disability, whether you have a caring background and so on. And all of that's on the form. Um, but we're also aware that some, sometimes in people's life journeys and life stories, there are other things which they think may be pertinent and that they, they either don't fit, quite fit into the form or they'd like to give a little bit more information about. So really what the dialogues are about, about just having a, a conversation. They're not an interview in, in that sense. They're not about trying to rate people. They're just about trying to understand people's backgrounds and predilections. Um, and I know that the Aziz will, will, will want to explore a little bit more about their um, interest in people's commitment to the Muslim community. I don't know if you want to say something about that, Zane. Yeah, um, I think I just want to say that, of course, that there's a social mobility criteria, which is the, uh, which is the uh, very much the, the bedrock of um, the assessment criteria for the Bartlett Promise. But in addition, there's the Aziz Foundation criteria as well. And the Z's Foundation criteria really revolves around commitment to British Muslim communities. Um, so um, I want to obviously bring in SAFE in a minute, um, just to give you um, an indication of the, um, the type of commitment that we expect from our scholars in relation to their local community, but also the campus community um, as well. Um, but uh, really, we want uh, scholars that have a great deal of understanding and knowledge of British Muslim communities um, and also can explain how their professional development, which will be enabled by the course, will also enable them to better give back to um, British um, Muslim communities. Um, when we also ask questions around, for example, some of the pressing issues um, facing British Muslim communities today, and we know there are a whole plethora of issues from Islamophobia to structural racism that affect um, our communities. And we want to know um, from um, prospective um, applicants and also shortlisted candidates, um, the type of issues affecting them and the type of issues affecting their communities. And of course, this scholarship is geared towards um, rendering the built environment more inclusive um, and also including British Muslim communities who are most of the private communities in the UK in the conversation with UCL and uh, with the, with the Bartlett School. We also ask questions around their, their role model because we want to know about um, their, what's made them as a, um, as a British Muslim or someone who works within British Muslim communities um, who want to do a lot more working within the communities um, and also translate uh, a lot of the discourse around the built environment um, into a community context 
so that um, local people can can understand and engage um, with this high level academic discourse. Um, I just wanted to maybe bring in Safe because Safe is a um, wonderful um, scholar and uh, alumni, and he's also done a lot giving back to his community in, in, in East London. So if he could maybe just give us a, um, a bit of information about what he's been doing, I think that would be very beneficial for those uh, that are listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zane. Thank you. Um, firstly, I, I come from a background where, um, you know, there's not many people in my family who, um, who've had degrees. And then when they have, it's been a very much an uphill struggle. There's been all sorts of other things in, in, in our way. And I, I was a carer last year and I still am a carer partly for a disabled parent. And I think all of those things can really kind of accumulate into kind of looking at and uh, these multiple sort of inequalities that can happen on a very personal level and which can stop you from moving forward with your education. And certainly for me, what ended up happening was I, <clears throat> I went into the communities I'm already a part of. I live in East London in Stratford. My parents live in Upton Park. There's all sorts of planning issues in the built heritage env environment which aren't really being addressed. There's a huge miscommunication and misunderstanding of how policy works and what one word means. Even the word diversity can mean something very different in a different circle. Now, all of those have an impact, especially when you come from a community which is largely sometimes quite quiet um, and for all sorts of other reasons. And all, um, all of those are starting to see themselves out now in the public space. And uh, so what I started doing was join with campaign groups and pressure groups such as Just Space Network. And they're a kind of umbrella group of about 80 different um, organizations. Um, who talk horizontally about, um, across the board about the impacts of some of these policies, whether they're built heritage policies or the way something's designed, the way something might be privatised, where, where is the public in that? And all of these things obviously play themselves out um, in the public sphere and really impact people. And with all the change happening in East London, for example, uh, it becomes increasingly important because people are talking about the city moving eastwards. And UCL themselves, they've got their a new campus east, um, in Stratford E20. Um, so um, for me, I, I came, very much came from a background where um, I was definitely experiencing all of those sort of impacts. And I wrote about that in, in the year that I did the master's, um, which was last year. And in the end, I kind of wrote about um, the impacts of heritage policy, cultural um, policies, um, and um, their impacts on ethnic minority culture. And in fact, it's huge, it's hugely important and the impact is huge. And it's felt at different scales and different levels of society. Um, and I, th I think that requires a very kind of sensitive and nuanced approach and um, a level of understanding of communities. So for those people who are replying, I would say, try and research about the communities around you and trying to see the relevance of um, um, if it is a particular community, if it is a particular faith community, it's trying to look at those um, that, where that, you know, plays itself out in terms of policy. Um, I just had a meeting just before this meeting with some campaigners about a similarish thing with the, for example, one of the key things I'm looking at is cultural heritage. So the, the Masters at, um, from Aziz Foundation really did give me an opportunity to kind of push the game up in terms of where I'm coming from, what I'm talking about. So, such as a few months ago, we, I had like the mayor, I was addressing like the mayor of London about um, the Fishersgate Goods Yard um, development. And you're able to kind of bring in words and the language that's needed to say, well, actually, no, these are policies that aren't. Uh, you're saying one thing, but the impact's very different. And I think that's really, really crucial. And I think certainly in London, that's what, that's really what's happening. What's happening is um, we're seeing a change and the change is definitely going in a very different direction. And UCL is probably the right place to have that conversation uh, in because they're, for me, they've been more likely um, to be critical and to analyze certain processes in depth. Just to add to what they've said, I think, um, to preempt some of the questions um, from um, those that are listening, um, some someone might say, "Well, what does community engagement mean um, in, in concrete terms?" And what I'd say to that is, we don't want to be too prescriptive um, in relation to defining community engagement. But what we will say is that community engagement could mean, um, for example, engaging with your Islamic society on campus. Um, it could mean 
engaging with local civil society um, organizations embedded within the community uh, around you. So it could mean a whole host of things. Of course, we're really open to trying to understand how you're engaging with the community on your own terms. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question, if I can ask you this, Ian, um, what is the most important thing that you look for um, in an application you know, for shortlisting? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. I should learn, shouldn't I? Um, just to be clear, if the question is about what do we look for in your application to the master's program that you're applying to, then um, you then obviously we're looking for academic ability and people's suitability for that program. But that's not what this session is about. This session is about um, the Bartlett Promise uh, uh, Scholarship. And just to be clear, just to repeat what I what I said earlier, um, we're, we're not looking specifically for academic ability in this. Every, the, the view we take is that everyone is equally the same in their academic ability because they've been offered a place on a master's course. So we're not looking for anything on that. What we're, what we're looking for is people who are underrepresented amongst the students that we have um, at UCL. Um, and by reflection, you know, in the wider built environment professions as well. So what we're particularly looking for are people who meet our criteria. So the criteria are about financial need. They're about whether you're from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background, whether you're from the gypsy, Roma or travel league community, things to do with disability, being a care leaver or having care responsibilities, whether you're... Um, family have previously attended a university at undergraduate or postgraduate level. So we're looking for people who meet those criteria. And effectively, the more of those criteria that, that, that you meet, um, the more likely you are to be awarded um, uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, scholarships. Um, and in effect, we give a, a, a score for each one of those. And it's quite a simple arithmetic um, process. The, the, we, we then shortlist people based on um, the, the degree to which they meet the criteria. And the shortlisted people are asked to have this dialogue with the Windsor Fellowship. And then that's just to explore a little bit more about their people's life journey and so on. And sometimes we find out a little bit more detail that, that, that subtly then modifies and just reassures us about the, the decisions, the shortlisting process. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we're looking for. Um, and um, um, uh, Zane has already explained and so has given us a little bit more context as to what the um, Aziz, Aziz Foundation are looking for, for their additional three scholarships as well. I don't know if you want to say any more again, Zane, or so for about that. No, I, I think we've um, said all that we can in, in terms of our criteria. I think maybe I'll just uh, address the point that was made a few minutes ago about support. And we know that there's a great deal of support offered by UCL and the Bartlett in particular in relation to um, the provision on, on campus. Um, and, and I think we offer additional package of support as well. We've rebranded our leadership support scheme um, to Scholarships Plus. Um, and um, I can actually say I've, I've administered our mentoring program and we've assigned 90 mentors um, over the last um, two years, uh, which is um, I think an incredible um, achievement. And that's, I, I think that's really important because we know that um, there is a dearth of, or um, there is little social capital let's put it this way, uh, amongst British Muslim uh, communities. And that, that really hinders them when it comes to um, professional development. Um, and we also know that there's a broken pipeline um, when it comes to the transition from postgraduate study um, and uh, work to working within industry. Um, and that, that needs to be mended. And these, I think these schemes are really important um, way of doing that. So for the mentoring scheme, we can, we can loop um, Z scholars into professional networks, um, particularly uh, British Muslims are excelling in their, in their field 
um, and are happy to share their contacts and the unwritten rules of success. And this is something that they, many, I think, um, applicants will, will benefit from uh, greatly considering um, uh, the background of the vast majority of British Muslims in this country. And we also have now um, an internship schema alongside that. And while at the moment it's focused most on media, so for example, there's an there's a, um, internship with the um, Bureau of Investigative Journalism and there's one in, uh, with the FT coming up, which isn't so uh, maybe relevant to the built environment and architecture. Still, we're expanding our provision um, all the time because we understand there needs to be a bridge um, from, um, from um, education um, to uh, professional life. Um, and just that, we've also got a webinar series um, this, is, this is our way to um, also in, enhance the professional development of our, of our scholars um, and we, a range of um, British Muslim organisations like uh, MLAG, uh, Muslim um, Legal Advice and Support and Guidance Organisation, provide professional development um, seminars through our webinar series. We also have some really um, inspiring people like Zara Muhammad. The general secretary of uh, the MCB and um, some some listeners might have um, I think heard of her interview on Women's Hour a couple of weeks ago um, and um, some of the maybe hostile line of questioning and she's going to be speaking about her um, her journey her leadership journey as the first um, Muslim um, woman um, to become the general secretary of the MCB which is quite an, quite an achievement indeed um, so and those are kind of inspiring individuals that we have through our, our webinar series. Um, again, I mean, I'm conscious of the fact that none of that necessarily relates directly to the built environment, but it does say something about the general, um, the general culture um, that we have at the Aziz Foundation of um, trying to really support, help and nurture our scholars. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, just as similar to um, what Zane has just answered, what kind of support is available after completion of um, the master's degree, if, if there's any? Oh, no. Am I, no, I haven't muted. Um, I think the short answer to that is we're still working on that one. Um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to dodge that one slightly. As I say, this is a pilot scheme. Um, and we've just got our first year of undergraduates and our first year of master's coming in. Um, what I would say is that career support and professional networking are a big part of what we want to offer. Um, and we, what we're also very aware of, and we found with the undergraduate scheme, is a lot of the professional companies, um, planning, architects, um, construction and so on, are very interested in the scholars who are engaged in the, in the Bartlett Promise. Um, and we've already started to have um, professional conversations with, 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 and careers conversations with those students. So we, 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 will, we will want to help people on their onward professional journey. Um, uh, once they've left the scheme, uh, once they've left U, uh, the Bartlett and UCL at the end of their masters after the year or maybe two years if it's a, or 15 months if it's a slightly longer masters, um, obviously, we, 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 we wouldn't give um, any direct support in that sense towards people. But what we're also hoping, is, as I said earlier, is that we want to build up this community of people that embraces actually people who are thinking of coming to university, who are thinking of doing their first year of their undergraduate, who are studying at undergraduate, who are thinking of doing a master's, who are thinking of doing a PhD students at all those levels and people who have left. So we want to build um, a network that supports everybody um, and not just the, the students who are enrolled at any one time. So we're at the start of a, of a journey with this program and we want to develop it and make it larger in kind of every sense of that over the coming years. And of course, work with wonderful partners like the Aziz Foundation to do this as, as, as well because that expands everybody's connections and networks and, and sense of community. Thank you. Uh, so this question is uh, probably for Ian and Zane. Uh, what is the major differences between how you assess um, applicants who apply for the Aziz Foundation or just the um, Bartlett Promise um, Scholarship? 
I mean, from our, from my perspective, the 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 the, 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 the as it were, the, the the first set of criteria which I talked about earlier are, are common to both, um, and um, uh, um, that they, they they relate to all candidates. And I think Zane, you've already described your your, your criteria, which the Aziz, you know, um, um, also articulates for your for your three scholarships. Yeah, that's right. I've, I've got nothing to add. I don't want to repeat myself. Yeah. But you know, um, uh, essentially, you know, they're an integrated scheme. Both schemes are looking at students who who we we know are underrepresented in the Bartlett. At UCL, we know we need to do better on this, and we know are under are, are, are sadly and unfortunately unrepresent, underrepresented in the built environment um, communities. So we've, there's a you know a slight uh, additional focus to the Aziz, but really the, the the big picture is 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 the same. I just want to add something to what Ian said, which is I think to really um, avoid any sort of confusion. I mean, I think I mentioned. Um, at the start of this event that I manage the Preferred Partnership Scheme at the Aziz Foundation. But it's also, it's really important to emphasize this is not a this is not a preferred partnership scheme. This is an institutional scheme. And there's a conceptual and there's an administrative difference, distinction between the two. The preferred partnership schemes, um, there are parallel processes at play. So there's the admissions process, which is run by the institution in the standard way. And then there is our own processes for um, awarding the scholarship. With this scheme, uh, I want to really emphasize and reiterate what Ian said, it's an integrated scheme. So all the deadlines are set by the Bartlett promise. So don't, don't get confused with this scheme and any other preferred partnership scheme. We have a whole portfolio at the Aziz Foundation. So it's really, I think it's easy for people to get confused if they look at our website, but I would direct you to, in particular, the, the Bartlett um, institutional scheme webpage on our website, which has got all the all the dates um, that that you need. But yeah, you know, it's this the scheme is completely run by the Bartlett with the Aziz Foundation feeding in um, at this stage of shortlisting the candidates, and we're also part of the dialogues with the Windsor Fellowship as well. And uh, the questions um, that we're going to ask are the ones that I've already articulated um, in my answer to a, to a previous question. They were quite we're quite open about what the questions are because as Ian said, it's a horizontal exchange. It's not about catching anyone out whatsoever. It is very much about understanding your lived experience. And I think we can all agree here that we need to understand the lived experience of those from BME backgrounds to a much greater degree than we do at the moment if we're gonna have uh, uh, disciplines that are truly uh, inclusive and, and indeed have universities with a truly inclusive learning environment, which is very much um, one of the goals of the Aziz Foundation in co-developing this inclusive learning environment for, for British Muslim students. Thank you, Zane. Uh, Saif, I have a question for you. As a Aziz Scholar alumni, can you talk us through how um, the application process or the interview, how all that was for you and how you approached it? Well, I've been I've been keeping my eye on the um, the scholarship for a while, actually, if I'm honest with you. But um, uh, and they were giving out a few every year, and then that year they were giving out double the amounts, and I was like, whoa, like double chances. Here we go. So, um, um, so I applied, and and actually the the application process was quite simple in that sense. But in, uh, what what it does do um, it did for me was it really kind of helped me kind of narrow what it is and why I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Like I come from an arts background of what in architecture, architecture probably pays a lot better than the arts um, for me, but it works the other way for some people. But um, similarly kind of looking at what course might work for me and uh, architecture and historic urban environment sounded like the kind of course which um, had the flexibility that I needed, whether you're looking at um, policy, which I was really into, um, when we were taking apart the London plan, such as for community campaigns and pressure groups across East London. Um, and also because I have a passion for art and architecture. And in, and in the end, the outcome was very much a reflection of that. You know, I had um, a half an essay for my final, um, um, for my final essay, um, I had an essay which was half marked, but then there was also a part which was a photographic exhibition. And then there was an online map 
which people can add to. So the thing is, there's that flexibility, which sometimes you need when you go into communities in order to kind of communicate ideas to them, which are very complex. And with those maps, um, I'm doing other things. I'm showing people, I'm showing them to um, policymakers in town hamlets and in Newham. And for them, a lot of these kind of people who are working in these public bodies often don't have the time or the knowledge um, to do that. So it's really important that we do go out there and tell those stories. And like Zane was saying, the lived experience and co-production, what does it really mean at the moment? They can just be words unless we do, um, you know, put our foot in and say, hey, um, this is what's going on. And this is this might be a way of working together on stuff. So it's exciting. It's a lot of work, but I think things will get easier only because you put the work in. But um, initially, the application process was actually quite simple. Um, and in terms of the um, the interview, the interview was a little bit daunting, but it was fine because I, I mean, I think I laughed through most of it um, just because there was a lot of jokes and things. So, <laughs> so um, be yourself and don't um, and just go for it. You know, that's my advice. I think from the other side of the interview table, I think we thought a, a safe and adorable chap. We, we have to give him the scholarship. Um, obviously, I say that somewhat um, facetiously, but I think just in in terms of. Um, in order to really be clear about the processes, SAFE was awarded a scholarship, if I'm right, SAFE, was it 2019, wasn't it? Right. So, yeah, so um, the Bartlett Promise process is somewhat different from what Ian said, um, uh, with the Windsor Fellowship um, facilitating these horizontal dialogues. Um, so maybe SAFE was, um, maybe um, the fact that he was intimidated was because we had a traditional um, interview set up and there was also three three people back then we've only got two people on the interview panel these days but back then it was it was three um, so I can completely understand why um, SAFE was intimidated but these dialogues are will be different um, and the application process is somewhat different uh, somewhat uh, similar um, but completely administered by the Bartlett promise so don't don't be um, completely misled by what we're safe is saying the experience is was slightly different from from the experience of uh, prospective um, applicants and, and and candidates in this scheme. And that's been clarified. I wasn't intimidated, by the way. I was I was laughing through through most of it. It's all jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much, um, Peter and Ian. I think this question might be for you guys. Um, does the Bartlett have any links with Greater London Council um, working to improve council or low income housing? Peter, do you want to uh, answer that or do you want me to have a stab at that one? Well, I, I, I'm not clear of all of the stuff that goes on. Um, we do have groups that, that work um, well, but part of the unique uh, Bartlett experience and certainly among uh, the different, we've got eight units um, and I know there are different parts of the Bartlett. So for example, uh, the Institute of Global Prosperity has developed the Prosperity Index in, in East London um, that's used to uh, look at um, a kind of widening, um, a wider view of, of what it means to um, uh, be prosperous, as it were. Um, you've got the development planning unit that also does work in London uh, with community groups. Uh, you've got the Bartlett School of Planning that does uh, works with a, a number of different um, counts, uh, yeah, councils. So you've got groups spread out that do various works and that's integrated into the teaching and research so you as a student would be uh, integrated in that whole process of dealing with those communities. I'm not, um, I'm not aware of the specific element that you're asking about, but there's certainly uh, enough people within the Bartlett community that are dealing with um, basically doing pro bono work for the, you know, for the community areas. Um, and you, you, that's part of the engagement process for a, a number of the students and a number of the programs. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 if I just to add to what Peter said, um, the Bartlett's kind of an extraordinary place in that it, it covers the full range of the built environment spectrum. Um, and it does so, and it's large. You know, we have three and a half thousand students. We have many hundreds of staff, not all of whom are full-time academics. Many of them are professional architects, planners, heritage experts. Um, we have people that are effectively abstract conceptual artists and we have people working in social science and we have people who are physicists. And 
we sometimes joke about this, but it's almost as if, you know, you, if, if, you, if you're interested in anything to do with the built environment, someone somewhere in the Bartlett will be an expert or they will be close to that and they will be absolutely able to encourage you to develop that in, in your own research and your own education. And I don't think there are, I don't, I mean, maybe I would say this, wouldn't I? But I don't think there are many places in the world that can offer that kind of breadth of expertise. Um, and it's absolutely the case that the Bartlett is plugged into London and is concerned with all the, the demands of, of, um, of uh, housing uh, and indeed many of the other problems and challenges facing cities like London, as, as Peter has articulated. So if your question is about, can I, you know, can I follow that kind of direction um, if and when I come to the Bartlett, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Yes, um, and we'd, 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 we'd love to explore your ideas with you. Thank you. Um, Peter, if I can ask you this one, um, how long does UCL take to um, give out offers? So those who have applied for a master's um, degree at the Bartlett, how long do you think will take them to get a response? Uh, you've given me the, the poison chalice here, Kemi. Um, okay. <laughs> To, to be frank, uh, you're looking at four to six weeks um, as, a, as a kind of minimum time frame at the moment. So you need to get your application in as soon as possible. Um, what we're looking to try and do is to make sure that anybody um, that is looking at the scholarship, uh, that, that we, we keep an eye on them. That's the best thing I can say on that so that... Um, you, you know they don't um, they don't stay they don't stay on the in the in tray for very long hopefully yeah um, so it, it, it is a we ha, we continue to be very popular with students um, so to give you an idea of the scale we've got about uh, sixteen thousand applications at the moment for the fifty odd programs um, so the good thing is a number of our larger programs are closed um, uh, so. If you're not into those already, um, you need to you need to be quick about it. Um, but again, four four to six weeks uh, with a fair wind. Thank you. Uh, so this question is uh, more of a clarification for um, Zane and Ian. So this person would like to know the eligibility of the scholarship is decided by UCL Bartlett Promise and the funding only from the Aziz Foundation. I'm just clarifying as I'm a little confused how UCL will judge the impact of British Muslim community and advocacy. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's a really, it's a really good question. So, so for the Bartlett Promise scholarships, which are um, obviously not to do with the Aziz criteria, then obviously that is not part of it. For the Aziz Foundation, um, three scholarships. Those questions around um, the contribution to the Muslim community will be looked at by Zane and the Aziz Foundation but, and, um, and may be explored a little bit more at the dialogue with the Windsor. So I'm involved in the selection process for the, for the sort of um, non-Aziz criteria but I will not be making any judgment on, on the impact on Muslim community. Zane, do you want to um, uh, clarify that as well? I think that's my understanding. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think um, um, obviously the, the Aziz Foundation have got the expertise with engagement with British Muslim communities, and uh, we'll bring our knowledge to the table when it comes to um, the, the dialogues. Um, and uh, just to give you a bit of context, We've awarded over 350 scholarships to British Muslims over the last two years. And that is um, roughly 4.9 million pounds invested in British Muslim communities. Um, so it's a considerable amount. And uh, I think last year when we awarded 200 scholarships, um, we interviewed over 400 candidates. And I was involved in two thirds of those interviews. So um, I think we're probably best placed to really understand the the contribution that candidates are making to um, to British Muslim communities, um, the level of knowledge, um, engagement, and uh, and commitment. Uh, I just want to add as well that the full title of, of the Aziz Strand of the Bartlett Promise is the Bartlett Promise supported by the Aziz Foundation, um, and that's really to acknowledge the fact that uh, 
the Zees Foundation is, is funding the tuition fees while the Bartlett Promise is um, offering the living stipend. So they're covering the living, living stipend. So this is very much a, a joint um, endeavor. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got a question for Peter as an academic and Uma as a, a student. Any tips for a master's personal statement? Yeah, I, I, I'll, um, I'll tackle that one first. Um, education is a, a co-produced uh, uh, activity, as it were, or a co-produced service. And what I, what I mean by that is um, most of the academics here feed off of engaged students. So in the personal statement, the first thing that uh, an admissions tutor would look at would be, uh, are you engaged, right? Have you read the website? Do you understand what the program's about? Um, are you clear about the work that's being done there? How are you demonstrating then what that is actually going to do for you uh, in the future? Because the, the other thing is, um, all of this work is usually applied. It's focused on professional activity. I mean, I come from practice, um, was a consultant for a number of years. And so what, what, you want, what we want to see really is, is how, how you see this is going to change um, your career, uh, provide new opportunities for you, um, that type of thing. Um, you would be, you probably won't be surprised that if you got the wrong name of the program, uh, that application goes swiftly um, by and we get on to the next one, okay? So um, just to recap there, uh, the engagement is important. Uh, you understand the program and uh, you understand where you might go with this. Where is it gonna take you? Um, yeah, I, I, I want to stress this a bit because it's really important to, to uh, know the program you're applying for, so not what the requirements are. I remember when I applied, there were four questions I needed to answer and to, you know, to offer detailed responses in a word limit is also really important. So be sure you're saying the right things because you have a word count you need to take in consideration. Um, but also be really honest with your application. So if you feel that at one point in your life, you know, there was something that was going on, but you learned something from it and, and you think that you can contribute with that in, in studying and it could help you be honest about that. Don't be, don't be ashamed about any kind of these things because they happen. Um, so really bring that, bring that forward. Um, and I think on a final note, just, uh, make sure you you put your enthusiasm in words because that's really important to be passionate about your, what you're studying and it, you know I think that's what they're looking for at the Bartlett everyone is so passionate about what they're doing both students and staff and make sure you emphasize on that. Thank you. Uh, Saif do you want to add anything to that? Yeah I think the passion is really I mean it, it tells you a lot I mean Bartlett's um and the top one in the country I think this year and um, and in the uh, second uh, around the world and I think the other thing is I've always known Butler as a kind of you know shining sort of example and once you're in it you realize there's so much going on at any one time you know and you really and what's good is to know what you really really deeply enjoy and you really want to head towards and learn from and I think that's one thing um, which was really good about the course. It was one year, it was very intense, I have to admit, because um, the final um, essay I had to uh, do, do it during lockdown. And But the previous modules were really, really useful um, in terms of realizing ideas. So where, where there was group work and um, um, like from what, one of them, I was looking at um, working class heritage in the built environment, which is obviously like um, an area which isn't really um, addressed in a lot of policies. Um, there was that, there was um, looking at just gallery spaces across a little stretch of a road or whatever it might be. And all of those things um, really, you can really kind of try out ideas through the course of the year. So that, that was excellent. And also you get to meet some really, really good um, practitioners and some great speakers. So there's always so much going on. So I, I definitely feel like I'm part of a community um, there's something, what is it called? Um, I've suddenly become a plug-in or the other way around. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, can I ask, um, we know that if you've um, already, if you already have a master's degree, you can't then apply for this scholarship, but does that include um, anyone who has studied an integrated master's? Yeah, well, I, I'm going to have to um, take that away under advisement, actually, because 
it's certainly the case that most people treat integrated masters as masters programs that's right isn't it peter they're considered to be masters it's like you've done a three-year undergraduate and a one-year masters um, having said that some masters degrees are treated by different universities as if they're undergraduate so my initial thinking on this is that we yes we would treat an integrated masters as if it were a regular masters but I'm going to have to take that one away to my um, fellow Bartlett Promise team and take it under advisement and we'll clarify that on on the website within the next uh, few days it's a really good it's a really good question and I'm not quite sure why it didn't occur to us before um, um, we'll um, you can tell this is a pilot scheme in, in some way, so we'll work on that. Um, but uh, we'll clarify it shortly. Thank you. Uh, another one for you, um, Ian. Uh, how is um, an applicant's uh, financial needs assessed? Do they um, need to be on a, some kind of a benefit, or how will they prove that they're in? How will they prove their financial situation? Yeah. So um, um, we we ask people to declare this. Um, there's a certain kind of honesty involved in it, and we ask people to declare it of a particular date in the year. Um, we, don't, um, we don't do a forensic economic check on every applicant, but, we, but, but, but applicants need to be aware that we may do that at some point um, if we realise that or have reason to believe that, that, that what they've said is their their income is is or um, is not the case, so um, um, uh, it, it's based on a. But you, um, it's a bit like the census that we've just had in the UK. Um, was it last Sunday? That as of a certain date, what was your what was your income? So we don't ask you to assess what your income will be while you're doing the masters. It's at the, the at the uh, during the year of application, during the months of application. I can't remember the exact date um, off the top of my head. Um, so that's how we that's that's how we do it. Thank you. Um, are postgraduate diploma students qualified to apply for this scholarship? So a diploma is not a master's degree. So yes, if you if you, if you've done a postgraduate diploma previously, then you would be able to um, apply for a master scholarship. Um, I guess if somebody applied that previously done what we called the postgraduate diploma in architecture 20 years ago, which is a, you know, an 18 month long postgraduate degree, and we now call an MArch, then we might query that. But if it's a regular postgrad diploma, then, then no, that wouldn't disqualify you from applying. It's only those students who have um, uh, done a master's degree that, that we don't want to um, uh, um, support again because they would already have done a master's degree. Yes, uh, I think this might be our last question, and it's for you, Saif. Um, how would how would you say you've benefited from the Aziz community and mentorship? It's a good question. I mean, the, the engagement's really changed, and it's changed within the three to four years. Um, so platforms change, and it's really important to kind of go out there and start to tell people about. Uh, the projects you're working on. Um, just prior to um, getting my final grade uh, certificate, well, um, there was um, something called Inclusive Spaces, um, UCL Bartlett's Inclusive Spaces talk. And I, I just wanted to use that as a platform to tell them about my findings from my um, essay. And luckily that was accepted. So that's coming up on 28th of, um, of um, April. So um, that's been really good. I think the other thing for me as well is it really, it's kind of given me a really boost in confidence in terms of kind of what you're talking about in academia, what you're talking about in community and what you're talking about in, um, in education. It, I mean, um, in policymaking is very different. And I think you're um, in that way, joining up the dots has been really, really important and really useful. And those conversations have continued um, with various bodies, public bodies, and um, and even with firms, you know, architecture firms are saying, well, actually, we never looked at the world like this. I mean, there's all sorts of um, practitioners who who start off with their own uh, in their own firms, and they they take a different approach, a different philosophy. So in that way, um, it's kind of it's opened up a lot of things 
uh, in terms of practice related stuff. And I've started my own practice a few years ago. So in that way, um, you kind of build up your own philosophy as well about how you look at space, how you look at practice, how you look at architecture in the city, uh, through which lens, where's your positionality and all of that that as well um but from i mean on a practical level on everyday level i'm able to kind of talk about more about hang on a minute have you thought about this you know have you taken um have you taken the model or i mean your data and the information you've gathered have you really thought about this community here have you really accessed that and i think for me that's been really really important so how do ethnic minorities, how do Muslims, how do different faith groups, how do they navigate the city has been really um, something that I feel like I can talk about a bit more, yeah. So, um, and the um, and with the scholarship um, community, with the Aziz Foundation, it's ongoing. We've, we've even got a WhatsApp group, so, so it's pretty active. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, I just wanna say a massive thank you to every single person on our panel. Thank you all for answering the questions and thank you to everyone who tuned in, who participated. Um, if you do have any further questions, please um, log onto our website. And if you look in the chat, there's some information and some links on there for you where you can um, contact us for further information. If we're, we were unable to answer your questions today, you can email us and we will um, chase that up for you. Uh, once again, thank you to everyone and hopefully we'll see you at UCL and the Bartlett very soon. Bye everyone. Thank you, Kemi, thanks. <laughs>